A very good morning and welcome to you all here in the sanctuary and at home on Zoom. My name is Lynn Turvey. My pronouns are she, her, and I am your service leader this morning. I will be joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let go just for a time of the everyday world. We'll quiet ourselves, our phones, and our devices, and we will create a space in this hour to just be together in life and love. To bring us into that joyful moment this morning, please join in singing our hymn of the month, number 368, Now Let Us Sing. You'll find that in the gray hymnal, and the, ma the words have magically appeared on the screen behind you, and they will at home on your Zoom screen, uh, thanks to the marvels of <laughs> technical, modern technical capabilities and our wonderful tech crew. We were introduced to this hymn last week as the hymn of the month, and it is a two-parter. So I think for now, if I lead this sort of half of the congregation in part one, and the words are up here, and Reverend Rosemary will lead this part of the congregation in the second part, alternatively, you can sing whatever part the Spirit leads you to sing, <laughs> just as those uh, on Zoom will and can do. So if you would please rise as you're willing and able for him 368. And if Karen could just lead, give us the first line of that hymn, that will give us our notes. Now let the sin and the power of the faith within sing to the power of the faith within. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Sing to the power of the faith within. Sing to the power of the hope within. Sing to the power of the hope within. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Sing to the power of the a lot better than last week. <laughs> We're learning. <laughs> oh, that won't happen this week. You're fine. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many sources. Whatever you believe or don't believe, whomever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. Please join us for conversation after the service. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada. 
which enrich our community. We never forget that we live in a region that had more residential schools than any other part of Canada. We acknowledge the huge damage that continues to cause. We celebrate the progress that is being made by our First Peoples as they find their rightful place. Reverend Rosemary will now share some announcements. Good morning. I'm Reverend Rosemary Morrison. It is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation as their minister. What a joy it is to be here this morning with all of you. So yes, I do have some announcements. I'm excited about some new things that are happening this, uh, this fall. One of them is um, that we have our Soul Matters theme-based services happening. We have Soul Matters theme-based uh, uh, religious exploration happening for children and youth. And we have Soul Matters theme-based small group ministry happening for anyone that wishes to. So every month, you will all get a Soul Matters packet that will be accompanied with your newsletter at the beginning of every month. And in there, whether you decide to be in a Soul Matters group or not, you'll get access to links to videos and readings and all music, all kinds of things that pertain to our theme of the month. This month, it is the path of belonging. Next month, it is the path of courage. So look for those um, in, with your newsletter. Look for that packet as well. We're going to, there's lots of folks that have signed up to be in a uh, Soul Matters group, and there's still lots of room. We actually have three leaders ready, willing, and able, and trained to uh, lead Soul Matters small groups. So it's very exciting. Hopefully not just to me. All right, the last Monday of the month is going to be You Use On Tap. We're bringing that back. It was a, something that folks were really interested in having come back. And to be honest with you, I've always, every uh, congregation I have served, I've brought it to them as well. And so uh, I'm excited to be doing that. This, this, uh, this month on September 26th, we'll meet at Brewster's in Union Square for um, you can join me for a meal around 6, 6.30 uh, and stay for a beverage of choice, a meal, a five minutes, the whole evening, whatever you choose. And the following Wednesday after that, on the 28th, we're going to start our book club up again. Uh, the link will be in the um, weekly e-blast as well as in the newsletter. And so you can join. We haven't decided our books yet for this year, so bring your suggestions as to what books you would like to read. All right, and my last announcement is that we would like you to bring your announcements, if you have announcements from the floor, that you bring them to me ahead of time, myself or the service leader, or put them in writing for us to read for you. So that being said... We have Mike that was just to make an announcement, and if you have any other announcements, if there's any announcements that, uh, from the floor, you can come afterwards. But it's going to be the either the last or the second last time we're going to be doing announcements from the floor. So mine's not so much an announcement as a thank you to some people around the church. Yesterday, your board got together for the first time in a few years, and we had a nice retreat right where you're all sitting here. And Marilyn, Susan, Gerard, Zoe, Andrew, myself, Rosemary, and who am I forgetting? And Lynn Wolf uh, all showed up and put in a day so that we could get together, work out you know, what the board needs to be, what the board needs to do, how we need to work together so that we can go, going forward for the next year, give you an, a board that looks after you and that you can count on. So I just wanted to thank all those people for putting that day forward and taking a day out of their lives to come in and do that and keep everybody apprised that your board is working behind the scenes. We, we take care of stuff around here. We are doing stuff. Feel free to reach out to any of those names that were mentioned if you have anything you think 
needs changing around here. If you don't like what we're doing, reach out to myself or Rosemary, Reverend Rosemary, sorry. No disrespect, man. Um, and have a great week. Perhaps the board members could stand, please. So we know who, board members, could you stand, that third of the members that are here? Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. So now, as we enter into the quieter time of our service, the, um, I invite uh, Karen to play a prelude for us as we settle and breathe and take this opportunity to enter into this time.
rise in body and spirit if you are able. And sing number 301. all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. Those in the sanctuary can use the envelopes found in the inside cover of the hymn books uh, if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift. Please indicate your contact information so we can send you that receipt. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to an, uh, the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash received is given to an outside organization. For the month of September, we are supporting Camp Fire Firefly. Camp Firefly is a fun, educational, social, and personal leadership retreat for queer and trans youth ages 14 to 24. Campers explore their identity, build resilience, enhance self-esteem, and develop leadership skills that will positively impact their lives, homes, schools, and communities. The ushers will now guide the offering plates through the congregation. Um, while that's happening, please join us in singing hymn number 1058, Be Ours a Religion, found in the Teal Hymn Book and again on the screens. Ushers may guide the plates. offering plates forward as we sing from you I receive.
of the traditions of the Unitarian Universalist faith is that we light candles of joy and concern. Um, most congregations do this. Some um, do it uh, actually light candles. Some just mention them from the pulpit. Sometimes congregations, if they're small enough, people speak to those joys and concerns. And uh, I know that folks have been asking about when we'll do spoken candles again, and that's, well, we're going to get there, I think. Yes? Yes. He's the boss of it. <laughs> Gordon's the boss of, of that. Um, <laughs> he didn't know it, I don't think. Yeah, always, always a surprise when you find out you're the boss of something. Anyway, um, so I would like to invite you at this time to come forward. There are two stations now, so one on this side and one on this side, to come forward, take a taper, light the taper, and light, use it to light um, your, your tea light, and then extinguish it in the water and put it in the basket provided. We're still not passing tapers. We're not going to blow on them yet. Um, so. I invite you now, if we could bring some of the lights down, and I invite you to come forward and light your, jo your candle of joy or concern, whatever is in your heart today.
these things in our hearts and our minds. And I'd like to ask Lynn to light one more candle for all the joys and concerns that you are continuing to hold in your heart, maybe unlit or unsaid or even unthought of yet. There are those things that are hidden even from ourselves. And I'd like to acknowledge that we have also um, lit our Ukrainian candle as we hold Ukraine and its people and in our hearts. I'd like to thank, um, I was walking with um, a congregant and it was mentioned that wouldn't it be nice to have everyone in the sanctuary when we were doing candles and I love that, having everyone here with us. And I am sorry to those online, I didn't remind you that you could put your joy or concern into the chat, but that is always your invitation if you're online. We move into a time of meditation. And here's how it's going to go today. I'm going to read a poem by Stephen Levine called, If Prayer Would Do It. I'm going to read it, and we'll have a few seconds of silence. I'm going to read it again, and we're going to have a few more seconds of silence. And then I'm going to read it for a third time. The reason for this is that each time you hear something like this, you find something else. And I invite you to grab on to different imagery each time the poem washes over you. And then at the end of it, we'll have about 30 seconds of silence together. If Prayer Would Do It, by Stephen Levine. If prayer would do it, I'd pray. If reading esteemed thinkers would do it, I'd be halfway through the patriarchs. If discourse would do it, I'd be sitting with his holiness every moment he was free. If contemplation would do it, I'd have translated the periodic table to hermit poems, converting matter to spirit. If even fighting would do it, I'd already be a black belt. If anything other than love could do it, I've done it already and left the hardest for last. If prayer would do it, I'd pray. If reading esteemed thinkers would do it, I'd be halfway through the patriarchs. If discourse would do it, I'd be sitting with his holiness every moment he was free. If contemplation would do it, I'd have translated the periodic table to hermit prose, converting matter to spirit. If even fighting would do it, I'd already be a black belt. If anything other than love could do it, I've done it already and left the hardest for last. If prayer would do it, I'd pray. If reading esteemed thinkers would do it, I'd be halfway through the patriarchs. If discourse would do it, I'd be sitting with His Holiness every moment He was free. If contemplation would do it, I'd have translated the periodic table to hermit poems, converting matter to spirit. If even fighting would do it, 
I'd already be a black belt. If anything other than love could do it. I've done it already and left the hardest for last. I invite you into about 30 seconds of silence. Take a couple of deep breaths. Thank you. The reading this morning is from Braving the Wilderness, The Quest for True Belonging and the Courage to Stand Alone by Brene Brown. In this, she says, as a clearer picture of true belonging emerged from the data, so she's a research um, scientist from Dallas, Texas, as she, as the true belonging emerged from the data, and I realized why we must sometimes stand alone in our decisions and beliefs, despite our fear of criticism and rejection. The first image that came to me was the wilderness. Theologians, writers, poets, and musicians have always used the wilderness as a metaphor to represent everything from a vast and dangerous environment where we are forced to navigate difficult trials to a refuge of nature and beauty where we seek space for contemplation. What all wilderness metaphors have in common are the notions of solitude, vulnerability, and an emotional, spiritual, or physical quest. Thanks. And I want to say that I, before you go, uh, Oksana, I want to thank the children for being here, and I'm okay with the noise you make. We're gonna, yeah, it's, you need to make more noise. More noise probably we wouldn't like. But the noise you've been making we loved. I loved. And I'm okay with the noise even through our meditations, and I hope you are too. I know it's going to take a little bit to get used to that. Anyway, an aside. Somebody said, I like the asides you do better than actually what you talk about. So <laughs> I don't know if that's probably true. Anyway, so belonging to so fully to yourself that you're willing to stand alone is a wilderness, an untamed, unpredictable place of solitude and searching. It is a place as dangerous as it is breathtaking, a place as sought after as it is feared. The wilderness can often feel unholy because we can't control it, or what people think about our choice, or whether we venture into that fastness or not. But it turns out to be the place of true belonging. And it's the bravest and most sacred place you will ever stand. We can't expect to take a well-worn path through these badlands. While I can share what I've learned from the research participants who practice true belonging in our lives, we all have to find our own way into deep into the wild. And if you're like me, you're not going to like the terrain. We're going to need to intentionally be with people who are different from us. We're going to have to sign up, join, and take a seat at the table. We're going to have to learn how to listen, have hard conversations, look for joy, share pain, and be more curious than defensive, all while seeking moments of togetherness. True belonging is not passive. 
It's not the belonging that comes from just joining a group. It's not fitting in or pretending or selling out because it's safer. It's a practice that requires us to become vulnerable, get uncomfortable, and learn how to be present with people without sacrificing who we are. We want true belonging, but it takes tremendous courage to knowingly walk into hard moments. End of quote. I could just read the book and we'd be fine. Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown. I invite you to watch her TED Talks, read anything she's written. She does not disappoint. And I think she has said all that needs to be said, and I can now go sit down and we can all go home. Dr. Brene Brown hits the nail on the head every time for me. She is one of my gurus, and the title of this message, We Are Worthy of Love and Belonging, is a direct quote from one of her TED Talks. So this month, our, our theme is the path of belonging, and Brene Brown alludes to the fact that this path is not easy. If we are truly brave enough to begin walking the path of belonging, we will find it full of pitfalls, misunderstandings, embarrassing moments, anger, shame, and feelings of abandonment. So why in the world would we do that to ourselves? Eh? Why bother? Why not just stay on the edge? Just dabble a little. Stick a toe in, check out the water, keep a safe distance, and above all else, protect our already wounded heart. Why indeed? Because, my dear ones, playing it safe keeps, it, keeps us from truly belonging keeps us from actually being seen and understood, keeps us from a richer and deeper experience of ourselves, of our fellow congregants, of our life. I don't know about you, but what I want from life are authentic experiences. I want to be in spaces and with people, I can feel safe enough to truly be myself, to be seen, understood, and loved anyway. As a friend from our Nanaimo congregation often says, with warts and all, ah, but it's all about being safe, isn't it? We can't let it all hang out as they say, unless we feel safe with one another. And we can't feel safe with one another if we can't trust one another. And we can't trust one another unless we have some shared understandings, some ground rules, and terms of engagement. So when I worked in a bank, yes, I worked in a bank, there were policies and procedures to keep us and the bank safe, mostly to keep the money safe. <laughs> so we could only keep so much money in our till. This is back before the centralized cash kind of thing in the banks. And there was no uh, ATMs. So we could only keep so much money in our drawer. And then below there was a time safe with a five minute timer on it. And then we had to put the rest of our cash in the vault, which you can, couldn't open for 24 hours. And there were buttons right here by my hand. I can, still, I can still tell you exactly where it was. There were buttons to press if we were being robbed or threatened in any way. We too need buttons to press, don't we, if we are to open ourselves up and make ourselves vulnerable. The path to belonging, as Dr. Brown says, is dangerous. 
and not for the faint of heart. So if we wish to truly belong, we need to equip ourselves with skills and protection so that we can expose our beautiful, wild hearts. And what are those skills? I was chatting with a congregate this week, and we talked about how important good communication skills are. We need to actually be able to hear one another, those skills of, of um, talking, saying, is this what I, you, I, heard, I heard you say this, you know, this reflection. Um, is that what you meant? There are skills to help us with that. We also need protection on the path. Hard hats and work gloves are worn to protect our bodies. Shared values, principles, and our vision, mission, and covenant statements protect our inner being. We can't expose our true selves to not one another without these things in place. It's not safe. So that's why I'm so excited that we have embarked on this amazing and important work. And so in a moment, I'm going to, if um, the tech folks could put up the vision, mission, and covenant of right relations statements for us, we're going to read through those statements together again this week. Starting, as I was told, with the vision. This, this week I'll do it right. So our vision Let's read that together, and I'm going to have to turn my head. I'm sorry. Our vision is, we open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. And our mission. UCE mission is to inspire social justice by questioning the status quo, engaging community, and inviting all to the table. We do this by providing an intentionally inclusive home to nurture spiritual growth and transformation, foster learning opportunities and outreach, for social justice, be guided by the principles and sources of Unitarian Universalism and our covenant. With love as our guide, we pledge to create a beloved community of peace and compassion. We trust our ability to work through conflict. As members of Friends of UCE, we agree to honor and respect diversity in values and beliefs as a source of communal strength. Be truthful, kind, and open-minded. Assume good intent and goodwill. Listen with open hearts and speak with care, even when it is uncomfortable. Talk to not about others. Accept responsibility for our individual acts. Address conflict properly. Ask for help when conflict is too difficult. Be steadfast in support of our community in times of disagreement. Share the ministry of the congregation through our gifts of time, talent, and money express encouragement and appreciation for the gifts of others. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it makes me feel safe knowing that if there are problems, the people are going to begin, and there's always going to be problems because, just so you know, we are all flawed human beings, especially me. So, how do you think these statements now in place will change the Unitarian Church of Edmonton? 
Will they have an impact? Do you think having a covenant of right relations will help you engage at a deeper level with others here? And what do you think are the next steps? The covenant as it stands now is only stage one. There are several more parts to it. What do you think those steps are? Have you always felt safe here? Do you put on protective gear to come to church? What would it take for you to feel safe enough to let your true, authentic self shine through, which will enrich all of our lives? I'd like for you to take a few moments to ponder these things. Oh, I've left enough time. Yay! <laughs> I did it. So I want you to get into groups. Yes, you're going to talk to one another for a few minutes. And if you would, jot a few things down. There is paper and pens at the back. If I could have Ashton and... Um, Jones, do you want to help get those around? There's pens. If you've got a pen in your purse or a piece of paper in your purse, use that. Um, so, and if you're online, Mike is going to, Mike Keast is going to put you into small groups. And if you could um, put your ideas into the chat, your thoughts uh, into, the, into the chat, and the chat will be saved for me. Okay. So, you've already started talking. Which is great. Carry on. <laughs> I was going to reread the questions. Okay. All right. Listen up for just a sec. I'm just going to ask for everyone's attention for just a second. How do you think these statements now in place will change UCE or your experience of? Will they have an impact? How do you think having a covenant of right relations will help you engage at a deeper level with others? What do you think are the next steps? Do you always, have you always felt safe here? Do you put on protective gear to go to church? What would it take for you to feel safe enough to let your true, authentic self shine through. Engage. Please um, begin to wind up your conversations. You got about 20 more seconds. And bring the online folks back, please. Give them a one minute. I love the engagement. And I hate breaking you up. But um, I'm going to. Gordon. <laughs> no more talking in class. <laughs> Thank you so much for your engagement this morning with this topic. It is so important to the life of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Is there anyone that would like, I was thinking that we could do, have one or two comments from your groups. Is there a phrase or two that's come up that you'd like to share? I'll, you can shout it to me and I'll repeat it so everyone can hear. Maybe keep it short so I can remember. Anyone? Uh, Alara? Yeah, so in our group, I was mentioning that 
I find the covenant a very helpful piece of documentation because it's kind of like worship is a container for us to put our thoughts and feelings into, whereas covenant is a container to put how we want to be together. And that's really important because it can be, a, and then I added that it can be that as long as it's a document that we come back to time and time again, and then when changes occur, we can make changes. So I guess that plays into next steps of just making sure that it remains a living document. So I mentioned how with youth, we actually go over our covenants every year, and we change it every year because we grow every year and change every year. So that's uh, that was kind of the, the piece that I was mentioning. I remember every word. I'll repeat it fast. <laughs> covenant is living document. Living document. Yeah, yeah, the, the covenant is a living document, and we need to continue to review it. And there will be next steps, which is the process for uh, what happens when we we fall out of covenant. So we can start to use that language of being in covenant and out of covenant. And how do we get back into covenant? So the covenant, as Laura was saying, is the, the container for all of this stuff that keeps us safe. Just like the cement in a nuclear reactor keeps the stuff safe inside. Right? Just like that. So I, where that came from is uh, I used to run this program called um, Through the United Church where I was a member in Canada. It's called fighting for your marriage. And so we used to do communication training with couples that were struggling in their marriage. And so that was the, that was the example they used, was that the, the more, the stronger the conflict, the heavier the boundaries needed to be, the heavier the structure. Yeah. So like we can have something as volatile as uh, you know nuclear reactors, because they're in really strong containers. So if we have a conflict, it gets heated. The more heated it becomes, the stronger the structure needs to be so that we can get through that. So we need to learn how to speak with one another when there is conflict, how to engage, how to, how to refrain from being conflict avoided, which is what all congregations are. I thought somebody would laugh at that, but no. <laughs> and, anyway, one more. Shorter, though. Do you mind if you're on the screen if you come on in? Um, uh, I need it to come down. Ruth said something first. Ruth Patrick said something. Ah, there we go. Ruth. Oh, Ruth Marion. My personal view is that this is a good time to create and sign on to a covenant because once a touchy issue gets going, it's a lot harder to introduce a covenant when feelings start running high. That is very true, and that's what I've been talking about. We have to have that container in place first, right? Before we can engage with one another on touchy subjects or hand handling conflict. And Yvonne just agreed with her. Right, okay. Um, Dorothy. Can I make a quick gesture? Uh, yes. I'm a member of the church probably longer than anybody else in here. I, I believe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but there has been, I feel, an unwritten covenant mm -hmm. within the church, which its boundaries expanded and shrank with different ministers and different leadership in the congregation. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been pretty successful with it. But I really think that it is a good thing. Yes. So Dorothy was saying that you know there's been unwritten, unwritten policy around covenant and how to engage with one another, and it shrinks and contracts with different ministers that are here. And uh, but that this is a good idea to have it in place, and then it doesn't rely on the leadership. And that's it's there. It's yours. It becomes yours. Jones, last comment. Mm -hmm. um, being that I'm new to the church, it's been very advantageous. Um, and I, all sorts of people try and grab me and bring me into this community. They just want me here. Just want we me really do want you here. <laughs> Thank you. And I want to be here. Um, and reading this covenant today made me feel safer and made me understand that there are there is a community and it is established and they have common grounds for how to handle conflict. And it made me feel safer as a new member of this congregation. So 
Thank you, Jones. And yeah, thank you very much. You're here. So I'll repeat it. I, I'm sure uh, folks that are hard of hearing and, and folks that are online didn't hear that. And Jones was saying that as a new person, we should have just brought you up and given you a mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as a new person, having these ground rules in place makes Jones feel safer, makes them feel like they can be more fully engaged it, and, um, you know, rather than feeling like, you know, because yes. um, oh, as, yes. a, as a new uh, attendee and a young person, um, I can only imagine how many suggestions for involvement have come your way, <laughs> <laughs> Jones and Ashton, yeah. and anything that you can offer us is holy great. great. I'm so grateful to both of you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to leave it there, and uh, we'll, we'll begin our uh, singing our final hymn, Lean on Me. And the words are, are there, and it ends with the bridge, which is a really funny place to end. So we're going to go back to the chorus, and we'll sing that a couple of times through at the end. Uh, feel free to rock it. I invite you to uh, rise in body or spirit as you are comfortable.
as I read our closing words, Belonging, by John Donahue. There's something there that's a little... Uh, it's on the lower left. These words are by John Donahue, Belonging. May you listen to your longing to be free. May the frames of your belonging be generous enough for your dreams. May you arise each day with a voice of blessing whispering in your heart. Something good is going to happen to you. May you find a harmony between your soul and your life. May the sanctuary of your soul never be a haunted place. May you know the eternal longing that lives at the heart of time. May there be kindness in your gaze when you look within. May you never place walls between the light and yourself. May you be set free from the prisons of guilt, fear, disappointment, and despair. May you allow the wild beauty of the invisible world to gather you, mind you, and embrace you in belonging. And before I offer words of benediction, I'd like to say a couple of things. I'd like to thank each and every one of you online and in person. Are you on? Are you on? Uh, am I on? No, I think I muted myself. I think that'll help. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start. So before I offer you words of benediction, I would like to thank all of you for being here online and in person and for your wonderful engagement. I would like to thank all the participants from Karen and Lynn and Mark and there's just so many to name. I always worry about naming the people that helped this morning because I'm going to miss somebody. So I'm stopping. There's a whole bunch of people that worked really hard to put this service room and I want to thank them. I also want to mention that I, I uh, acknowledged the binary language in the last hymn and I'll make sure that it's fixed for next time. And I offer you these words of benediction, and they are familiar words to you. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things can break. We know that. But all things can be mended. Some things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you all to go and love intentionally. Love extravagantly and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. Go in peace, my gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. I invite you to sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. If you wish, you can do a circle thing or stay in your seat. We'll make sure someone is with you to sing. No holding hands. We're not doing that. Unless you normally hold hands <laughs> with the person. <laughs> yeah, my shoulders are fine. I don't know.